so busy thanking Wanda for that. I didn't hear. Did you guys say amen? Amen. Come on. Come on. Amen. They're working on it, Wanda. <laughs> Delighted to have you here this morning. Thank you for being part of our worship service. We have a number of announcements to share with you. Pass to Hans. Let's do it. Oh, nah, nah. <laughs> Wanda, would you like to come and invite people to 
participate in the glorious choir they're going to hear today? <laughs> so I know it's only October, but uh, in the music world we have to think way ahead, and I want you to know that you are not too late to join singing with this wonderful choir for the Candlelight Christmas program, which will take place Friday evening, December 14th. And uh, it's such a beautiful evening, and you get to not only enjoy learning all the music and singing it, but it's a beautiful visual experience for in the choir. You get to down. Um, next week, the 27th, at 6.30, we will have Poetry Slam. And this is open for everyone. Um, great poets that we have been in contact with will come to our church and express themselves. And Pastor John will be one of the poets as well. So this is on the 27th at 6.30. It was going to be great. And the, the, the best part about it is that none of these poets are at Venice. And they took the time to say, yes, I want to come and express myself. And of course, it's going to be family friendly. So no worries. Um, do not fear. Fear not. <laughs> and Brian has an announcement. So I'm going to tell Brian to come on up. And Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. I have two things. One's an update, and the other one's an announcement. First update, uh, last Sunday, the young Sabbath school families from beginner, kinder, and primary, joined, we all got together um, at Bob's Corn and Pumpkin Patch. We had about 30 people attend, so we had a big group. Uh, you should see some pictures coming in the newsletter and possibly on the uh, church Facebook page of our Pumpkin Patch. Uh, so that was a very great success, great way for us all fellowship and get together and hunt for pumpkins and eat some good fall food and just hang out. And that's going to be in two Sabbaths. Um, it's adult Sabbath school, not for kids. And it's going to be open to all. It will be located in the chapel. And it's going to be kind of a different format. Um, the chapel's been empty during Sabbath school time uh, for some time now. And we're just wanting to create a space where we have some praise music. If you like uh, to sing praise music, going to be singing some songs. We're going to be having some time in prayer about focus on stewardship or on outreach and talking about why it's important for us to reach out to others and serve others um, as Christians and how we can grow from that. Um, so like I said, it's open to all. We know there's a lot of young parents who don't really have a space where they feel like they belong. We've also got some college age college age individuals, those who are in their 40s and 50s, if you just like to sing some praise music or if you just want to uh, be part of a community. We're trying to create a space where we feel supported and um, as adults and we can all support each other and kind of grow together. Uh, so. And it's going to be at 10 o'clock, yeah, so about the same time that the Children's Sabbath School starts, 10 o'clock in two Sabbaths on November 3rd. And um, I'm going to be looking for individuals to help host this Sabbath School. Uh, I won't be teaching. Um, so fear not, in the words of Pastor Hans, yeah, we're not going to be expecting anybody to teach, but we are going to be having different hosts who are there on a Sabbath to make sure that there's someone to facilitate it, and we'll have a plan all laid out um, with Bible verses that go along with that, um, focused on our service or outreach uh, topics. So hope to see you there. Um, if you'd like to help out, please come and see me. Otherwise, I might be coming to see you and reach out to you. So, happy Sabbath. Thank you, guys. Now I want to invite you to stand, greet one another, pass God's peace here in God's house.
I'm going to invite you to find your seats. I saved two announcements to last. They're the best. And of course, I didn't forget to do this earlier. You know, I strategically saved these announcements for now. Yeah, right. But... We had another baby. Not not Karin and me, but <laughs> but we, the Green Lake family, had another baby. Um, many of you were at the shower. Langston James Henry Hayes. Boy, can you imagine what's he going to grow up to be with a name like that? I love it. Langston James Henry Hayes was born on September 20, and. Uh, uh, I've got a bunch of thank you cards for you folks that were at the shower on my desk to give you, but just want to congratulations to the Hayes and, and to us for this new child in our family and there's, there's more babies in the oven as we speak. <laughs> and speaking of children, we have at Cypress Adventist School, we have a preschool and there is a special visitation day for on Friday, November 2, and we'll have that announcement in the bulletin next week, but uh, just mention it now. Hey, if you know a little one, you north of Seattle, that direction, um, pre-K visitation day, Friday, November 2, at Cypress Adventist School. And now I invite you to open your hearts as the choir calls us into worship.
creator of earth and sky and seas, thank you for calling us to this place and receiving us with your smile. Lord of the cosmos, we pray that you will hasten the day when all things far and near are ordered according to your good pleasure. Lord of the nations, hasten the day when swords are beaten into plowshares and spears are turned into pruning hooks. Lord of the church, so work in us, mold and shape us, that in the week to come, we may act as agents of your kingdom to bring hope and help and healing. It's our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. There's a trending subject that's become fashionable, the loneliness epidemic. Most major media have done stories on it. Senator Ben Sass of Nebraska is out promoting a book that he's just written on that subject. And these all reference various studies and surveys that have been done. Rather than give you a bunch of statistics, I'll just summarize all of this as follows. Loneliness in this country is common and increasing. Social connectedness and the quality of relationships are predictors of physical health, longevity, and the quality of life. Social media friends are not effective substitutes for real ones. While loneliness is hard to quantify and, studies re and study results vary, the trends are clear, and the suggested solutions are pretty consistent. More quality personal engagement with other people. Churches are often cited as having the potential to help with this. Certainly the Green Lake Church offers many opportunities to engage with lots of people, even to form close friendships which extend beyond the church functions and I can personally attest to that. Just spend time in the kitchen during potluck. Everyone is busy but having a great time working together. And of course, there's no closer click than the choir. There are lots of activities that everyone can get involved with and make new friends. And you'll never have a pool to draw from that's more accomplished, interesting, and diverse than the people here at the Green Lake Church. Oh, and with a shared religious tradition. And to think that all of this is just a byproduct of worshiping God. This is the time when the nominating committee is working to staff our many groups and committees. So do answer the phone and stretch yourself to join with others in meeting our many needs, especially our leadership positions. Running a church like Green Lake takes not only our time, but also our money. The end of the year is when most of us make our largest financial contributions. So please be generous. Think of the many ways your lives are enhanced, sometimes in tangible ways that you might not even think of. And make an effort to reach out to people. Let's do our part to stem the tide of the loneliness epidemic. Deacons, please stand. God bless our offerings today, returning but a portion of what we have received from you. Amen.
Good morning. <clears throat> I'm Kurt Rue, and I'm here to tell you a story. This morning, a story about a dog. And I know a lot of you have dogs. At least I think a lot of you have dogs at home as pets. Is there anyone here who has a dog that's here today? Not the dog, but you here. Good. <laughs> All right. Um, well, I have a dog, and my dog's name is Juno. And Juno, this is a story about her. Juno came to us when she was three months old. And when she came to us, she came with a lot of papers. And one of the papers was the report from her first visit to a veterinary doctor. And the doctor had written that Juno showed a gentle expression and was happy and friendly. Now, you know what an expression is? Expression is what you do with your face when you don't use words to say something. Like, if you were going to be mad and you had a mad expression, what would that look like? Give me a mad expression. Oh, yeah, that would scare me a little bit. Yeah. But then, what would a gentle expression look like? Show me a gentle expression. Well, actually, you look pretty friendly. That's nice. I brought some pictures of Juno, so you could see, this of course was she was a puppy. You can pass these around a bit. The veterinary doctor was talking about when she was a puppy, and she's grown up here. But she was clearly a happy dog, and we wanted her to stay that way. So, when she came to us, we took her to puppy school where she could learn how to live with us and how to obey us when we needed her to. Well, we found out that at school, whenever we wanted her to do something, all she wanted to do was play. And so instead of learning to do what we said, she would run over to another puppy and jump on it or dance around it and was a big distraction. In fact, if they gave grades at puppy school, she would have got pretty low grades. But we weren't worried about it because she had a gentle expression and she was happy and she was friendly. And that's where we left it until a problem came along. When we had her as a puppy, we did not have a yard. And there's some things that dogs need to do outside, like get exercise and go for a walk. So we would take her for a walk four or five times a day around the block. And we always had plans for what we wanted her to do when we went for the walk. And it turned out she had her own plan. So if she saw a squirrel, or if she saw another dog, or if she just wanted to go faster, she would pull on the leash and pull and pull and pull. And it wasn't a big problem when she was a puppy because she was little. But she got bigger. And she got bigger. And as she got bigger, she got stronger. And then it got so it was like a game of tug of war when we took her for a walk. And it didn't work out for us. And we began to get kind of frustrated. Well, we had heard from our friends about a woman who could make any dog do what she wanted it to. And it didn't take her very long. And we thought, that's what we need. So we called the lady that they told us about, and she asked us on the phone, what is it you want me to make your dog do? And we said, we want her not to pull. Could you teach her not to pull? And she said she could. So she came to our house about three days later. She came to the door, and we introduced her to Juno, the dog with the gentle expression, who was happy and friendly. And we explained what we wanted her to do, and she said, okay. And we put the leash on the dog, and she set out to take the dog for a walk to teach it how not to pull. We had high hopes. This would be really good if Juno didn't pull anymore she was getting strong and I watched them leave the house and the first thing Juno did was pull on the leash and the lady pulled back harder and then Juno pulled harder than that 
And the lady pulled back even harder and said something. And then Juno pulled really hard and the lady pulled really hard and I quit watching because it was hard for me to watch. Now, fortunately about then, they had gone around the block far enough that I couldn't see what was going on. So I went back into the house and waited for them to come back, hoping that by the time they got back, Juno would know how not to pull. When they came back to the door, I opened the door and let them in, and the lady took the leash off of Juno, and she went over to our living room, and she sat down on a chair, and she crossed her legs, and she looked like this. And Juno went into the dining room, and sat down on the floor and looked like this. It was staring. Can you stare at me? That's what Juno did. She stared at me. No, she stared at the lady. She just stared at the lady. We sat there, and the lady leaned forward, and she said, you know, some dogs are so happy and friendly, people don't bother to train them. And you know, I think she was right. Because she's nearly 10 years old now, and she still has a gentle expression. She's very happy, she's very friendly, and I think that's just who she is. <laughs> Now, it's actually, Juno comes to church with us, but it makes her nervous, so I leave her in the car. But I'm going to have her out in the side door of the church this morning. If you want to meet her and see how friendly she is, she loves children. But in the meantime, you can pick up some buckets and go get some money for our project.
Almighty and most merciful God, we kneel together this morning to worship you and to give thanks for our many blessings, the wonderful area that we live in, this beautiful building. We pray this morning especially for Doris Fultz, Jennifer Cummings, Linda Hybe, Becky Meacham, and Virginia Bach. We pray for all the other people in, this, in our church family in, with special needs this morning. We pray for the people in need throughout the world who are in distress. Bless us in the days and weeks ahead that we can walk in your way and do your will. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Old Testament reading today is from Jeremiah 29, verse 1 and 4 to 7. Jeremiah wrote a letter from Jerusalem to the elders, priests, prophets, and all the people who had been exiled to Babylon by King Nebuchadnezzar. And this is what the Lord of Heaven's armies, the God of Israel, says to all the captives he has exiled to Babylon from Jerusalem, build homes, plan to stay. Plant gardens and eat the fruit, uh, food they produce. Marry, have children. Then find spouses for them so that you may have many grandchildren. Multiply. Do not dwindle away and work for the peace and prosperity of the city where I send you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, for its welfare will determine your welfare.
New Testament reading today is from Luke 3, 3 to 20. Then John went from place to place on both sides of the Jordan River, preaching that the people should be baptized to show that they had repented of their sins and turned to God to be forgiven. When the crowds came to John for baptism, he said, You breed of snakes, who warn you to flee the coming wrath? Prove by the way you live that you have repented of your sins and turned to God. Don't say to each other, we're safe. Aren't we all descendants of Abraham? That means nothing, for I tell you, God can create children of Abraham from these very stones. The crowds asked, what should we do? John replied, if you have two shirts, give one to the poor. If you have food, share it with those who are hungry. Even tax collectors came to be baptized and asked, Teacher, should, what should we do? He replied, Con collect no more taxes than what the government requires. What should we do? Asked some soldiers. John replied, don't extort money or make false accusations. Be content with your pay. John used many such warnings as he announced the good news to the people. John also publicly criticized Herod Antipas, the ruler of Galilee, for marrying Herodotus, his brother's wife, and for many other wrongs he had done. So Herod put John in prison and added this sin to his many others. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of the word. If you watch the platform here at Green Lake Church, you will see all kinds of people. We do not make distinctions. We have children. We have ancient people. <laughs> Hi, Elsie. <laughs> we come from different backgrounds, different cultures, different colors. You know, if you watch what happens, you would know that this is a place that welcomes all. And we hope that that is understood to be God's welcome to all. However, there is one place where we visually appear to make a distinction. You know, Hans and I, sorry, we're guys. And I'm concerned that our young people, I would assume the old folks understand, hey, we simply happen to have the job that we do. But our children will see that week after week in the pulpit, it's only guys. And some of them will think, oh, well, that must mean only guys can speak for God when it comes to the sermon. So starting next month, every month, we will have at least one Sabbath a month, the preacher will be a woman. Um, yeah. um, and um, maybe when I get old and retire, we can hire a senior pastor that's a woman. That would be good. Who knows? Maybe before I get... No, you can't do it before I get old. I'm already there. <laughs> I'm going to start by asking the kids a question. Um, I... I We'll see how this goes. I, I don't usually do this. Um, I see two young experts, Ava and Sophie. Could I ask you a question? It's not a hard question. It's not a trick question. Um, see, do either of you guys have a dog or a cat at home? She has two cats. you got two cats. Okay. You have nothing. <laughs> you got a brother. I, I'll, I'll come to that. <laughs> so... Sophie, what is the job of the cats at your house? And, or, or what's their role? I mean, you know, they take up space, they're alive. 
why have a cat in the house? What's the value of a cat? To comfort people. You're the expert. Why? why? Yeah. Do, do you ever take care of the cats? Yeah. Do you like taking care of the cats? Sometimes. Sometimes. <laughs> if you had your way, would you keep the cats or get rid of the cats? I would keep the cats. So why would you keep them? Because, well, I'm the only child, so they kind of keep me company. They're com they keep you company. All right, yeah. I could think of better company than a cat. I like your dog. I want a dog. Some of you cat people are going to kill me. All right. <laughs> so what's the job of a brother? <laughs> um. <laughs> he, he will hear you. It will be on live stream, so don't don't say something too bad. Okay. Um, I, oh, wait, I'm sure brothers have some jobs that are unappreciated, but is there anything about having a brother that is useful or, or valuable? Okay, when I'm bored, um, he'll come up to me and bother me, and then I'll play with him, and then it gets fun. Yeah, that makes sense. All right. And let's see. Is there anybody here who has chickens? I don't see the bakers. I think bakers have chickens. Anybody here that has chickens? Oh, you're going to answer the question anyway. What? Okay, so bakers have chickens. What's the purpose of having a hen at your house? Fresh eggs. Fresh eggs. Yeah. Do you know what's the value of having a rooster? That might be harder. You might not know that. What? Um, um, maybe like alarm clock. Oh, there you go. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you, ladies. Appreciate that. I actually have a very serious purpose behind those questions. What's the use of a church? Why have one? Like a cat, it's work. Thank you for all the work you folks do. Oh, and our guests, are you Janet? Janet and Winnie on the oboe and violin, thank you. And Laura on the bells, we had some guests helping us make music. Thank you so much. Church is work. What's the use of church? Two thousand years ago, before Jesus was a thing, I'm sorry, some of you old people, that language may not resonate with you, but I, I think it, it, can I say it that way? Before Jesus was a thing, there was another preacher. His name was John. And he was creating a huge stir in Palestine. There were a lot of people coming to hear this guy named John preach. And he would have fit right into the old south you know, a fire and brimstone preacher. Did, did you hear that in our, our scripture reading? I mean, it, this guy, he was, he was hammer and tongs, uh, thunder and, and bombast. Um, when the crowds came, he said, you brood of snakes. Blah. Who warned you to flee from God's coming wrath? Prove by the way you live that you have repented of your sins and turned to God. Don't tell me what you believe. Show me. But I, I could almost, you know, I could, I could preach this. All right, you guys. John especially attacked self-confidence rooted in 
ethnicity, and religion. I'm an American. So, or paraphrase John, shut up! I'm Jewish. I'm Adventist. Shut up. Now, it's important to notice where this flows. What was John after? He was a coach, he was a teacher. He was a prophet. And all these hard words were not his point. He did what worked in his culture to get a particular reaction. My guess is if I hollered at you, you'd go, I'm out of here. But if you go to the doctor and the doctor says, you go, if you don't quit that, you're going to die. You probably go, oh, so what do I do? And that's what the crowd said to John. John was delivering a very scary diagnosis. And the crowd responded just the way he hoped. They said, oh, okay, what do we do? And John goes, ah, thank you. That's what I wanted you to ask. Historically, our denomination has imagined itself as a John the Baptist church. John the Baptist was preparing the way for the Messiah, the new age, the breaking in of God into human history. And that's how we see ourselves. Jesus is coming again. Our job is to get people ready. And we have explicitly compared ourselves to John the Baptist. And if we do our job, people will ask, so what shall we do? By the way, if they're not asking us that question, we have probably botched our job. I won't follow that one. Um, now I could imagine in some context if somebody asks you so what should we do you start well and then you want to you want to make it kind of complicated and esoteric and you know you need uh, 26 weeks to study it and um, John had no problem answering their question, and we have no trouble understanding it. The end of the age is on us. A new day is dawning. What do we do to get ready? You got two shirts? Share one. You're not hungry? Good. Find somebody who is. John is saying, act like God. Jesus presents the primary characteristic of God as generosity. Matthew 5, be perfect as your Father in heaven. And people go chasing off, what does that mean? You don't have to go chasing off. Read the verse before. God sends rain on good people and amazingly on bad people too. What was God thinking? God sends his sunshine on the nice people and on the ordinary ones too. And then Jesus says, be like that. Be like your father. Generosity. Be generous. Cultivate generosity of heart, generosity of spirit. Because we're getting ready to go to heaven and heaven is a place of generosity. And if it isn't, who would want to go there? If we imagine heaven as a place that includes only flawless people, 
I'm not sure I'd want to be there. And I know you wouldn't want me there. <laughs> um, that's not the picture of heaven. The picture of heaven is a place of generosity and abundance. You're ready for it. By beginning here to let God's character flow into us. And then John got more specific. Tax collectors showed up and they said, John, what do we do? I mean, we heard you. You, we, you, you said practice generosity. John, our job is to collect money. That's the opposite of generosity, isn't it? What do we do? And John said, well, quit being tax collectors. No, he didn't. He said, do it right. Really, if we're going to understand the context here, we need to see the tax collectors as business people. In that world, they were, in fact, independent contractors. They were business people. No business can survive if it doesn't collect money. And I don't care whether you're the government business, which needs money to operate, or whether you're a private business. Any, a business to operate needs to collect money. And John honors that. He doesn't say, quit collecting. He says, collect ethically. If he was talking to a business person, he would say, make a profit. Don't make a killing. But you've got to make a profit or the business doesn't survive. And the business can't do what it does. I want the grocery store to make a profit because I want them there tomorrow because I love shopping for groceries because I love eating food. John honors the ordinary work of commerce and then says, do it ethically. How do you get ready for the second coming? Do whatever it is you're doing ethically. Write code, drive a bus, sell a car, build airplanes, heal people. Think of all the kinds of jobs and vocations represented in this congregation. The reality is that the, 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 the world that we live in and enjoy needs the work of all these different people. It is not more Christian to be a preacher than to be a plumber. What do we do? We live ethically. Then the soldiers came and said, so what do we do? Remember, these soldiers represented an occupying power. They were the effective police of the day, but they were police representing, a, you know, not an entirely friendly power. What do we do? And notice again, John does not call them away from his, their work. He honors their work. And calls them to do it ethically. What does a Christian policeman do? What every good policeman does. Enforces the law. Serves society. What does a Christian policeman not do? What bad policemen do? <laughs> it's, it's not all complicated. It's not tied up in sanctuary doctrine and theories about heaven and theories about revelation and prophecies that are obscure. How do you get ready for the coming age of the Messiah? Do what God called you to do in the place God called you to do it. And that's going to begin and end with being ethical. We could stop right there, and my guess is it would be real easy for us all to just go, amen. Yep. We're good. 
got to tell you a story. Just this week, I got an email from somebody I never met. have no idea who it is. Her first name is Emmy. Spelled in a way I've never seen Emmy spelled before. And she thanked me for something I had written. And then she said, well, I put a link on my Facebook page to an article you wrote about Green Lake Church. And she said, I had lots of friends come, you know, comment below this article going, whoa, we would love to go to a church like that. The interesting thing to me is that if on Facebook I found out who this person is, and that's a big if, but just judging from the content of the email, this is probably still true. The person who's telling me this is somebody whose connection with Adventism is just barely. And I'm going to guess that a lot of those people saying, I would go to a church like that, are people who do not go to church. So what did I write in this article? I just talked about you guys. I talked about the choir and the bells and the orchestra and the kids who read scripture better than us old people. I talked about a community devoted to worship, engaged in worship, a community that comes back week after week to renew our hope that Christian values are still real and that they will triumph. Amen. And then I talked about the other crazy stuff you people do. Like sending kids to camp. And taking care of your neighbors. And chasing down the long lost relatives of one of our older members who was put in an orphanage when she was like five years old. And when she was in her 70s, somebody in this church went and found her entire family and gave her back nieces and nephews and brothers and sisters she only suspected existed. That's what you do. And even people who don't go to church and people who are not sure about God, when they see that, they go, yeah. Jesus said, the world will know that you are my disciples if they see God's love among us. Not when we explain 1844. The world is not hungry for a little bit of arcane theory. It is hungry for the life of an authentic community Amen. united in worship of God and in service for mankind. John the Baptist didn't stop there. He understood that if the church is going to speak its values clearly, it must also speak against the clear expression of contrary values, especially when those values are modeled by the people at the top of society. John went after the king for the king's immorality, and he was clear enough that the king put him in prison. We would fail in our job if we as a church do not speak loudly, explicitly, and clearly against the values that are being voiced by the leader of our country right now. When the president of the wealthiest, most powerful nation that humanity has ever witnessed a nation with 350 million people looks south and sees 4,000 desperate poor people. 
And then says, we need an army to protect ourselves against those people. That's wrong. It's immoral. We cannot be silent. I don't suggest that there's a simple answer for the problem of refugees and dislocation and all of that. But I do know one answer that is wrong. To imagine that that's an invasion that we're going to call out the might of the United States Army to resist. That is immoral. I could multiply the examples. Right now, the Christian church elected the man who is inviting us to join him in throwing rocks at those poor people at the border of Mexico and Guatemala. We did it. We dare not be silent or we become complicit. And when the president of the church when the president of the Adventist church throws the full weight of his office into his struggle to deny women the proper honor that they deserve we cannot be silent. Here, in this place, we are not compliant. We will not be compliant. The greatest honor I think I've ever received came on Facebook this week. I had written something, and somebody tongue-in-cheek had joked about you know, I needed to be more compliant. And they were joking. It was, it was good fun. I needed to, you know, bow. And somebody who knows me well has known me a very, 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 very long time. Responding in the same kind of jovial thing. This is not a tense engagement. They go, ah, you know, John's hopeless. You know, when he was a kid, he got a nail in his head for being non-compliant when the neighborhood bully wouldn't go away. And then she said this, and I take this, and I'm going, thank you, may it be true, but I'm also saying it for us. May it be true for us. May we, may we be the beautiful picture that I paint of you. May that be true. I unapologetically polish this church. I make us better than we are. Of course. So that we have room to grow. This person said, he won't bend because he's got a case of hopeless integrity. Isn't that beautiful? That's us at Green Lake Church. May God grant us that. Hopeless integrity. We have heard the words of Jesus. What does it mean to live a godly life? What does God ask of us? To love God. And to love not just ourselves. But those in the ditch by the side of the road. Our neighbors who are dirty, muddy, and bloody. What shall we do?
face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen. Amen. Amen.